Greetings and welcome back. We now continue with our conversation regarding Beowulf Part 3. I'm with you in your hymnals on page 57. Beowulf has just said that he will be the one who will fight against this dragon monster. And now we're ready on page six, uh, 57, line 650. Let's continue. After he says this, he then, we're told, Beowulf rose, still brave, still strong, and with his shield at his side and a mail shirt on his breast, strode calmly, confidently toward the tower under the rocky cliffs. No coward could have walked there. Notice the little statement with the even the exclamation point. No coward could have walked there. In other words, Beowulf is going to fight and possibly die against a monster, we could make the argument that's actually more difficult and dangerous than either Grendel or Grendel's mother, okay? And then he would, he who'd endured dozens of desperate battles, who'd stand boldly while swords and shields clashed, the best of kings saw huge stone arches and felt the heat of the dragon's breath flooding down through the hidden entrance, too hot for anyone to stand, a streaming current of fire and smoke that blocked all passage. And the Geats' lord and leader, angry, lowered his sword and roared out a battle cry, a call so loud and clear that it reached through the hoary rock, hung in the dragon's ear. So in other words, let's just put it in our notes at level one. Beowulf shows up where this dragon lives. Now it is a cave, right? Like the, the uh, Grendel's mo uh, uh, mother monster, Beowulf has to go there, and then he calls out a large scream to the dragon, which is going to make it all the way to the dragon's ear. The beast, I'm at line 666, uh, ironically, on page 57. The beast rose, angry, knowing a man had come, and then nothing but war could have followed. Its breath came first, a streaming cloud pouring from the stone. Then the earth itself shook. Beowulf swung his shield into place, held it in front of him, facing the entrance. The dragon, I'm at the top of page 58, the dragon coiled and uncoiled, its heart urging it into battle. Beowulf's ancient sword was waiting, unsheathed, his sharp and gleaming blade. The beast came closer. Both of them were ready, each set on slaughter. The Geats, the Geats' great prince stood firm, unmoving, prepared behind his high shield, waiting in his shining armor. The monster came quickly toward him, pouring out fire and smoke, hurrying to its fate. Flames beat at the iron shield, and for a time it held, protected Beowulf as he planned. Then it began to melt. And for the first time in his life, note this at line 685, for the first time in his life, that famous Prince fought with fate against him, with glory denied him. Whoa, so let's just put it in our notes. For the first time in his life, Beowulf is fighting and he goes, uh-oh, this could end bad for me. For the first time in his life, he lacks confidence. For the first time in his life, he knows this may not, this may not work out for me the way I would hope. Well, let's keep working now. I'm on page 58, line 687. He, Beowulf, knew it. He knew that fate was against him. But he raised his sword and struck at the dragon's scaly hide. The ancient blade broke, bit into the monster's skin, drew blood, but cracked and failed him before it went deep enough, helped him less than he needed. The dragon leaped with pain, thrashed and beat at him, spouting murderous flames, spreading them everywhere. And the Geats' ring giver did not boast of glorious victories in other wars. His weapon had failed him, deserted him. Now when he needed it most, that excellent sword edged Theo's famous son, stared at death, unwilling to leave this world to exchange it for a dwelling in some distant place, a journey into darkness that all men must make as death ends their few brief hours on earth. Notice the metaphor. Life is a few brief hours on earth. Obviously, Beowulf has lived as king for 50 years, we're told, which is a longer than a few brief hours. What is the poet trying to suggest? Let's jump to 2A really quickly. The poet is trying to suggest that life is short. No matter how long you live, it's still short. Let's point out a couple of things from thus far of our reading. Notice, Beowulf's weapons 
and defense go away. His shield melts, the fire of the dragon, and his blade, his sword, breaks. And now he is left unprotected. But let's also point out, Beowulf does not run in the face of this kind of danger. Instead, he decides to stand there and to fight. Again, part of that Anglo-Saxon understanding of courage. Quickly, I'm at page, uh, I'm at, uh, uh, page 58, line 704. Quickly, the dragon came at him, encouraged as Beowulf fell back. Its breath flared, and he suffered, wrapped around in swirling flames, a king before, but now a beaten warrior. Notice all the foreshadowing. Let's jot it down at 2B. The poet wants you to know, the poet telling the story first, and then later the poet writing the story, wants you to know that Beowulf's end is coming. This is, again, what we call foreshadowing. We have the idea, uh-oh, things are not going to go well for Beowulf after all. None of his comrades came to him, helped him, his brave and noble followers. They ran for their lives, fled deep in a wood. For those of you who are Monty Python fans of the Holy Grail, run away, run away. This is, that, this is what we're making fun of. This is a famous moment in this poem. Beowulf the king is the old man, is fighting against this huge dragon. When the dragon comes out and jacks Beowulf, the response by his followers, his warriors that he took with him, to run away, to run away. Unlike the warriors who were with him when he fought Grendel, who tried to stab Grendel the monster with their swords, but it didn't help, these warriors run away. Why do they run? Simple. Fear. They don't want to stand there and get burned to a crisp, and so they get ready to run away. I'm at line 711. And only one of them remained, stood there, miserable, remembering as a good man must what kinship should mean. Only one stays. His name, I'm at line 714 on 58. His name was Wiglaf. He was Waxton's son and a good soldier. His family had been Swedish once. Watching Beowulf, he could see how his king was suffering, burning, remembering everything his lord and cousin had given him. I'm at the top of page 60. Armor and gold and the great estates Waxton's family enjoyed. Wiglaf's mind was made up. He raised his yellow shield and drew his sword, an ancient weapon that had once belonged to only his nephew and that Wexton had won, killing the prince when he fled from Sweden, sought safety with Herder, and found death. Uh, this is a reference uh, at the bottom of the page, footnote 12. When Onard seized the throne of Sweden, his two nephews fought, uh, sought shelter with the king of Geatland, Herder, Wiglaf's father, Wexton, killed the older nephew for only. Uh, let's point out for just a moment for your notes here. This is a significant moment in our poem. Beowulf, the hero of our epic poem, is about to die. He is fighting against the dragon, and in the moment that he is most vulnerable, as an old man, echoing the words of Hrothgar at the end of Beowulf 2, a young man, Wiglaf, has to step up and defend his king. Let's also write it in our notes. Wiglaf reminds himself of two things. One, the promise that he made to his king that he would stand by his side. Two, all of the stuff the king had given to the family of Wiglaf. In other words, Wiglaf thought, I owe this man my allegiance, my support, and he does not run like the other ones. Of course, notice how Wiglaf becomes the new Beowulf. Beowulf is now the new Hrothgar. Put it in your notes. It's a very inch, it's a very subtle kind of understanding. In the same way that Rothgar had to have Beowulf to defeat Grendel and Grendel's mom, now Beowulf is going to need Wiglaf to be able to defeat this monster, this dragon, right? I'm with you now on page 60, line 726. And Wiglaf's father had to carry the dead man's armor and his sword to only end. The king had said nothing, only given him armor and sword and all. Everything his rebel nephew had owned and lost when he left his life. And Wexton had kept these shining gifts, held them for years, waiting for his son to use them, wear them as honorably and as well as once his father had done. Then Wexton died and Wiglaf was his heir, inherited treasures and weapons and land. He'd never worn that armor, fought with that sword until Beowulf called him to his side, led him into war. But his soul did not melt. His sword was strong. The dragon discovered his courage and his weapon when the rush of battle brought them together. And Wiglaf, 
his heart heavy, uttered the king of words his comrades deserved. Let's point it out here that Wycliffe is going to now speak the kind of words that Beowulf is going to need to hear and as well these other comrades, the ones running away. Notice line 745. I remember, Wycliffe will taunt in some ways the guys who were running away. I remember how we sat in the mead hall drinking and boasting of how brave we'd be when Beowulf needed us. He who gave us these swords and armor. All of us swore to repay him when the time came. Kindness for kindness with our lives if he needed them. He allowed us to join him, choose, chose us from all his great army, thinking our boasting words had some weight, believing our promises, trusting our swords. He took us for soldiers. For men, he meant to kill this monster himself, line 755. He meant to kill this monster himself, our mighty king. Fight this battle alone and unaided, as in the days when his strength and daring dazzled men's eyes. But those days are over and gone, and now our Lord must lean on younger arms. It's an important line. I'd write it down. Notice, he says it. Our Lord, the older, must lean on younger arms. This is a powerful lesson in the Anglo-Saxon ideal. It says, old people have to accept the fact that the world is, in fact, for the young. They have to lean on the young as they get older. And there comes a time when the young, you, have to take over and lean. Now, one of the important ideas starting in this Anglo-Saxon epic poem and going forward in European and later American educational thought is the following, and I would write it down at 2A. The role of education is to prepare you so that later in your life, the old can lean on you, trust in you, turn the world over to you. And you will then lead the world, but only for a short time. Because you too will grow older, and you will need your children to take care of you. One of my seniors once pointed out, is this the reason why parents have kids? So that when they get old, they can say, I took care of you, now you have to take care of me. Certainly seems to be some suggestion of it here. You owe something to those people who took care of you when you were young, and they should expect you to take care, to be able to lean on you. Notice here, Wycliffe gets it. He says to his comrades, we made all these promises to the king, and now all of a sudden the dragon comes out, and we like run away, run away, because we're afraid we don't want to die. We have to have some courage. We have to be there for the old man Beowulf. I'm with you now on line 760. We must go to him. While angry flames burn at his flesh, help our glorious king by almighty God. I'd rather burn myself than see flames swirling around my Lord. I'm at the top of page 67, line 765. And who are we? Whoa, look at this line. Who are we to carry home our shields before we've slain his enemy and ours to run back to our homes with Beowulf so hard pressed here? I swear that nothing he ever did deserved an end like this, dying miserably and alone, butchered by this savage beast. We swore that these swords and armor were each for us all. Whoa. And then, we're told, he ran to his king, crying encouragement as he drove through the dragons, as he dove through the dragon's deadly fumes. So, Wigliff is now going to show great courage. The rest of the guys run off. And Wycliffe says, now is not the time to run. Now is the time to fight, to support our king. Okay. We're told that Wycliffe and Beowulf will kill the dragon. And when we return, we will get to the end then of our Beowulf part three. Thank you.